done in the past is we, if a, if a child is within two miles of another school, we have moved some students to another school. There's a couple of things we keep in mind. One is we don't move a child if they've already got a sibling at their home school. But two, we are also careful not to move a child to a school where they're going to go to the opposite middle school. Um, so we, we, you know, so for example, and this isn't the case this year, but if we were going to move some students from Barrows outside of Barrows, it would be better to move them to Eaton and not Birch Meadow because Birch Meadow goes to Coolidge, Barrows goes, uh, Eaton goes to Parker, okay. and Barrows is a is a Parker district. Thank you. All so, set. Let's okay. go. So let's go. Sure. Take it from here. Sure. So um, I want to thank Kelly uh, Colon, the, the facilities director, because she had a lot of input into this, and um, she unfortunately couldn't be here tonight because of child care issues. Um, but she met with uh, Joe Huggins and George Van Boris today, and George was extremely helpful. He provided her detailed site plans that showed where she would be able to tie where we'd like potentially be able to tie into utilities and water and other things that we would need. Um, as well as giving us some historical information of where things were previously. So both of them were very helpful. And uh, as I think Dr. Jordan mentioned, we are going to be having a meeting next week with the various um, stakeholders, um, the police, the fire, to look at other, other issues that we might have missed. So, the goals of this is to increase classroom capacity at three elementary sites. Um, options include from four to six classrooms. I don't think this one is in there. Did you get a copy? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, obviously, the, the three schools that we're talking about that are impacted are Barrows, Eaton, <coughs> and Killam. Um, a maximum of two modular classrooms at those sites is what is the maximum. Um, this is, I don't know if you can see it or not, the site plan for, for Barrow, you might be able to see it better in your handout, but we're thinking, uh, and we still have to do the feasibility study to see if this is where it could go, but this is where we're thinking it could potentially be positioned. Um, we do need to reach out to AI3. They did considerable work for us on a number of projects, so they already have a lot of knowledge about our, our district, and we think that they would have, um, they'd be able to, provide us some site survey information and other support and information that we would need to know where we can put things. So if I might interrupt you. Sure. Um, uh, and I was, uh, my kids were Birch Meadows, so I'm not as okay. familiar with Barrows, but it's my understanding that there were a portable or two? There were two portables at the Barrows site. It, is this putting them back in the same place? Not necessarily. No. One of the things that we've learned over the course of the last few days is that there have been changes in code on where things can go, and uh, the fire chief actually brought to our point today that right. um, how close they can be to buildings has changed based on the combustibility of the walls. So mm -hmm. there is definitely more due diligence for us to do in terms of where they can actually be placed. If well, I was to, excuse me, go ahead. Don't no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I was simply going to say, for a frame of reference, in the general area as they used to be. No, what 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 it seems like in the past with the old modulars from several years ago is that the codes were much more re well not relaxed but they were different and so what seems logical to do now and you'll see it at Joshua Eaton there was you know you could do there is actually still you can see where the modular used to be um, that may not be as feasible a location anymore because um, you have to have it so many feet away from the building or it becomes a sprinkled modular classroom um, so there's a lot of new factors that have come in place with the code since I don't know 10 years ago when we had modular classrooms in the district okay thank you so there, there's where I was pointing in the wrong place so there's where we're considering putting them uh, we're going to do obviously more investigatory work um, with Eaton there are a number of different options on where they can go. Oops, sorry. Uh, on where they can go at the Eaton site. Um, again, some of this has to do with where's where um, the ease of tying in to uh, to utilities um, and and easement issues and things like that. If if you might hold other other sure. questions at placement. 
Mrs. Borowski. Thank you. I'm glad you asked. Actually, <coughs> back to Barrows, just briefly. I know this is really, really early goings, but that would probably impact the area where students exit and enter the school and have outdoor recess time. I mean, have you, I know you're just beginning to think about this, but have you thought through the impact there? Or do we, is it just too soon to we, know? We've, that? we've had some conversations with Mrs. Leonard about it. I, I think what's going to, <coughs> unfortunately, what's going to impact a lot of the decisions if we move forward is um, where we, uh, from a code perspective um, and a conservation perspective, um, can place these modular classrooms. Um, with Barrows, what we're being told right now, and again, we have not had an architect involved. We are being told right now is that this is probably the only location you can have these mod modulars. We were thinking of over behind that parking lot. Mm -hmm. okay. My understanding today, and it was confirmed, there are wetlands there, mm -hmm. and it would be very difficult for conservation to approve putting modulars in that location. That's a hill. There's yeah. No, there's no water <laughs> anywhere there. <laughs> That's not what we were told. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Mr. Robin Seifert has uh, stated that that is dry land. But, um, <laughs> uh, and I would agree with Mr. Robinson, having been there many years. Uh, if there are questions, <coughs> uh, I'll kind of do that, and I'll, I'll ask if you guys have questions as we go, if the audience has questions. But please continue. Okay. So as I stated earlier, Eaton, there are a number of different options at Eaton that we're pursuing. And again, um, these are all just options at this point. We haven't, you know, not moving forward with any of them until we do some uh, feasibility and site survey studies. It, it would seem, and I know way early, it would seem that the left side of the school option, in, in, in my opinion, in my uh, uninformed opinion, is that that would be the nicer location if we could, so I don't. As you guys are doing this, just remember Mr. Caruso said, but I do think that that would be less <laughs> impactful on the the parking and the other activities that go on in that school. Mrs. Stocks. In these locations, are you talking about two modulars being placed in each of those That's ovals? Or are you talking about two out of three of those circles are going to be modules? I believe the plan Modul is two in both of those locations so that they're, they're closer to each other to, to, to get economies of scale with the utility tie-ins and site. For Killam, um, the, the most obvious option right now is to the left of the school, um, but we do need to do some more investigation there with um, with code in terms of how close it can be to the, the property line and, and things like that. So One of the things we were told today is uh, we could not do it in the back. Good. There's going to be some extensive field work being done there in the future. Good. I mean, that field is used, right? So, right. Uh, I, if if it could go where you're highlighting that, that would be yeah. wonderful. But I, I I am concerned at how close it is to the property line with that neighbor right yeah. next door. So, yeah. this is what. So um, maybe George has this information too, but I am thinking about the zoning, all the stuff we've just done at town meeting on the zoning, and there was a lot mm -hmm. of discussion and change on like accessory structures. So I would, don't know if it falls under that, but I would think, um, oh God, Jean. Jean, Jean, Jean was in this there. Part of it? And she'll be at the meeting next week. Okay, yes. okay, good. Because I think you, there's a lot of different, really critical pieces about the actual ability to locate in a physical spot that yeah, yeah this is it, what we would tell today is kill is probably gonna be the most challenging really location huh. even though it seems like well we got all this land but yeah because on on the site survey that we were looking at today it had a 30 foot zone on each side of the property but only a 15 foot down here at Havel Street so uh -huh. um, so it, it does appear that we might need to look at zoning if that's where they're gonna end up but again it's early so um, I wonder then also if that means, um, you know, just other options and probably the architect or, uh, you know, as you do the feasibility would know if you have to locate the uh, modulars closer to the building, it's probably a more costly modular, whether it's sprinkles or other things. So uh, you also, if you connect it to the building, it kicks in code for the oh, building. Oh, ADA. You have to... You have to no. It kicks in the sprinkler. Code oh, for, for the building, the whole building. building. Is not mm -hmm. a fully okay. sprinkled building, so we would have to upgrade that as well. 
which okay. would add another cost to this. This is Doctor. Um, looking at this and my knowledge <coughs> of Killam, I'm thinking about <coughs> access to the building for the children in those modulars and if they were to go in the doorway that's right across from where that's located mm -hmm. they would have to go through a classroom to get into the school I'm assuming that they will consider those yeah again these are the types of things in architecture <laughs> feasibility study so we're only showing you potentially where things could go the architect may say oh no no you you could put it here Dr. Yeah. Dart, if you show us pictures, we're going to comment. Right. So, uh, <laughs> there's no stopping us. Mr. Yeah. Robinson. Yeah. And to that point, I think, you know, whoever said that the field was off limits, uh, we need to discuss that again, too. That's a big field. We're not talking about putting a, you know, a big building back there. Uh, I would think, you know, obviously we wouldn't want to put it in the middle of the field, but... Mm -hmm. You know, to the left or above mm -hmm. that, where that left side of the school is, above where I believe that's where structure. the previous portal portable yeah. was. Yeah, that's the play structure. Uh, I, I yes. thought the portables <coughs> were in here. They were yeah. Yeah. yeah, they were. Yeah, there. Uh, which we know right now that that would not that we, that can't, we do can't do because of the new code. Yeah, oh. they were. So that was where some of our assumptions were. We could put them where they were before are, are not uh, accurate. Oh, in the courtyard. Oh, well, that that's not going to happen. <laughs> in the middle of the field. <laughs> in the middle of the field. <laughs> really, wow. Um, uh, this was, yes, it's an option. There, right. There's land there. Because so. drop off isn't already a nightmare right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, Thank you. You're welcome. Continue. So, um, so in terms of estimated costs, the, uh, there were two avenues that we were pursuing. One was to purchase them outright, and another was a lease to own option. So <coughs> purchasing them outright, um, I, I tried to organize this uh, as streamlined as I could. So in the four classroom scenario, where there's two at Barrows, one at Eaton, and one at Killam, uh, each modular classroom being 900 square feet, we would increase our capacity by 3,600 feet for an estimated cost of $435,000. That's $121 per square foot. Um, as Dr. Doherty stated, Th those four classrooms, that would get us to 2019-20 in terms of you know, short-term um, needs. Um, we have reached out to AI3, who have done previous site work for us to kind of let us know where, where those four potential classrooms would go. Um, the next cost, and so this is uh, kind of extrapolated for the five classes and six classrooms. So with five classrooms, we've gained 4,500 square feet of classroom space and uh, 5,400 square feet with six. 653. Um, where you're gonna have some economies of scale is, is your site preparation. We're estimating about $2,500. Oh, no, I'm sorry, did I make a mistake? Oh, that's not supposed to be 250,000. That's supposed to be, it's not supposed to be 75,000. Yeah, so yeah. Oh, well. So sorry, I apologize. This cost is supposed to be seventy-five thousand each, um, not two hundred and twenty-five thousand. Yeah, we estimated twenty-five thousand per site, and I apologize in my rush. I, I must have typed over something inadvertently. Um, the architectural services we're estimating right now at thirty-five thousand. Uh, again, that would be for the whole project, whether we do four, five, or six. Our furniture and uh, fixtures and equipment, we're estimating 25,000 per classroom. So at four classrooms, it's 100,000, 125 or 150. Um, I'm wondering if my subtitles are off. Four, yeah, they um, I apologize. Um, I factored in a 5% contingency, and um, those are the bottom lines. Um, for the estimated lease to own, this was a little more, I was trying to show this uh, in a year format. Um, so the Excuse lease, me, Mark, yeah. Just go back yeah. So to the bottom numbers, I, I can't. I know, that's what I'm saying. Do those, do those uh, add up to... I just super quickly did it and I, I'm 
I, don't, I think the bottom line number should be shorter than that amount. But I did yeah. really quick. It is shorter than that amount. Okay, good. Thank you for clarifying yeah. that. Uh, 435 plus 75 plus 30. Oops. Yeah, it's 645. So I, I apologize. I can update this, um, obviously, and, and we send it out. So it is it's significantly different. And unfortunately, this error is going to pull into my next slides because I pulled these numbers. That's why. So. The architectural services, I mean, we're like an annuity for AI3. Uh, <laughs> haven't they done enough work already to... This is a very high estimate. We reached out to AI3 today and we haven't had an opportunity to speak with him, so I wanted to be more conservative. Yeah, all of these are estimates. Um, we, we feel that, that we, we will be able to get it for a much lower cost to get a site plan, um, probably sooner than later, because they have so much data already right. that they have done on the elementary schools over the last uh, year or so. so um, but this would be more for the, if town meeting approves it, that piece of the architectural services is what we're talking about. Um, on the estimated cost lease to own, um, I broke it out by year. So the cost changes on the purchase, it's a, a $121 per square foot. On the lease to own, it equates to about $133 per square foot. So that's your cost of capital, about a 9% increase in our cost per square foot on the, the cost to lease to own. The advantage of lease to own is it spreads out the amount over five years instead of taking it all at once um, and as you out can of see, the wherever the source would be. Yeah. And as you can see, I, I had the wrong site work number carried forward in, in each scenario, so it's, uh, it's apples to apples and you're looking at that. <laughs> less, yes. So that, yeah, as, as Mr. Martin pointed out, the total would be $150,000 less. Okay. So, um, so here's your incremental lease to own cost versus purchasing them outright. Right. Questions? So on this slide, the difference in the incremental cost of the lease option is it'll be $150,000 higher in each case. No, it's $150,000 less. I have I have a $150,000 error in both options. But the, diff right, the difference is the difference. The difference is the difference, but like that 1.193 is you need to subtract 150. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Was it from both? Yes. 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 From both. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it would be the same. The same. Yeah. So the, the difference between the two is still the same number. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Uh, with these prices, are they predicated on a particular vendor that sells these, or are these just estimates? That well, right now, um, this, this purchase, because we're not um, bundling it to be uh, site preparation and delivery from the vendor, we can <coughs> use two different laws to do the procurement. So the actual procurement of the, the modular classrooms will come under 30B, and that we would not have to bail because there is a, a, a bid consortium out there you could buy from that does follow mass general law when it comes to 30B procurement. So there, uh, there's a vendor there that we could use and that's the 121. We have been want talking to another vendor as well and his, the pricing is, is very comparable. So, uh, which is reassuring to us that, that we're not being gouged by one vendor just because he's on a bid. So. <coughs> I was, I was just going to add, um, one of the things that we have included in here, we've made an assumption, and I think it's going to be valid, that we're not going to be able to use DPW for any site prep work because they're going to be fairly busy with the West Street project. We were told that today. So what you see in here is if we're hiring someone from the outside to do all the site prep work. Sure. Uh, Mr. Robinson, if I, if I could continue with your, were you thinking, hey, are there, are there different models of modular classrooms that we should No, I wasn't. Oh, right, done, right, actually. Yeah. My, I had a follow-up question. So we've been talking about, uh, I can't remember the town. Uh, oh, um, Sutton. 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 That potentially had 12. Uh, that 12. We could sell. Uh, are these those or are they? Are no, 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 these are brand new. Sutton's are three years old, but they are going to go out to auction and they haven't, they haven't gone out. On yeah, they're going to do they it. They haven't gone out yet. So we have that information for the 21st? 
The auction? Whether, yeah, I mean, that's So we could that. certainly, we could certainly ask them uh, if they have a timeline. That actually is related to my question that, and I asked this last time about if, <clears throat> if we have a window that we are committing to using these modulars for and our long term space needs committee is coming up with a longer term solution. What is the market for these build it, these modular buildings after we've used it for six years? Is it still auctionable or resellable? And what kind of, I think, town meeting will want to know what we can recoup <coughs> sure. in I six years from what they spend now. We've spent you know, I'm not sure what the depreciated value of them would be six years out from now, but I certainly can do some research to, to try and uh, reasonably determine that. It is worth mentioning that, I mean, depending on your definition of short-term, short long-term, mm -hmm. we are looking at this as a five-year-plus solution. So this does give the town, the Space Needs Committee, this gives everyone involved enough breathing room to solve it permanently, if you want to use that word. But this isn't a short-term get us through the next 18 months. This is a no. five-year-plus minimum right. mm -hmm. solution. Just, just make sure we're all clear on that. Mrs. Browski. Following along with that, um, what's the lifespan of one of these structures? I believe 10 years. Okay, I said it, it's at least 10 years. It's at okay. least 10. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. I'd, I'd say it's at least 10. In, in our conversations to date, it has been at least 10 year yeah. minimum on the lifespan of these structures. Oh, assuming you don't move them yeah. too many times. Because <laughs> every time you move them, it, it does affect the, the structural integrity. If they're nice enough, they'll move to my backyard and other than that. <laughs> <laughs> Your kids will stay around. Um, I just wanted to reiterate that I'm looking at this as a short, short, as in five, six kind of year, because I did call to be able to go visit North Andover's modulars, and I made the mistake of ca calling the wrong school. And when I called them, the secretary called me back and said, the teachers suggested that I should call you back because our modulars are 20 years old, and they found it very hard to believe that you would want to see them because they're 20 years old, <laughs> then probably what you wanted to see was the newer ones at the Early Childhood Center, which are close by. Yes. And so my point is that I don't want in 20 years for us to be saying, you really don't want to see our 20-year-old modulars. You want to see our long-term solution to this space issue. So I, in, in light of that, I think one of the reasons it's important that we're looking at that time frame is because I think as a community we have, you know, operational budget issues that are paramount um, and I think as a community for the schools and the town, those are things that we're going to need to address. And so by, you know, looking at this as a solution that, that will be sort of a minimum five year and maybe a ten year view, I think it allows you know us to serve the needs of the students that are here in our district right now today mm -hmm. that would like to be a part of the district but also allows us the opportunity to address the operational issues so that we can serve the kids that are in our district um, currently in in a manner uh, that's closer to to maybe some of the things that we would like to do so I think for that reason you know this is important and doesn't mean that the uh, the work that this the space group I think this the, the, the uh, mm -hmm. that was a bad way to say it but they want to you know, that work is important in terms of that you know next phase um, you know when we're uh, maybe a few years already into an override Mrs. Brosky. I actually want to piggyback on exactly what Mrs. Webb just said um, I another benefit for the long-term space group is we've been working under a the sooner we can solve this problem, the better. And that actually limits your choices. Now we could be talking about what would a solution look like in five years, and maybe the ideal solution is seven or eight years or ten years away, but now we have ten years to plan for mm -hmm. it and a reasonable interim. So I, I do like that it offers multiple options that we don't currently have. And I did have one question as well. Of course. Um, it has to do with safety. Oh, sure. I hate that in this day and age we have to ask these questions, but in the age of Alice drills, what kind of safety mechanisms? I, I assume the doors lock automatically behind you. I mean, what kind of safety do these provide? Um, honestly, we haven't really explored that with the if vendor, you could, but I think if those are, that's a very good Yeah, if you could add that to the list of things you're looking at, I'm, I'd like to hear a little more information about, you know, in the event of a, a crisis, where do the students go in the classroom? How protected are they? Okay. Thank you. 
I do believe that they're they're connected to the building enough in, in such that like when the morning announcements are made, they're going to hear them in the classrooms as well. So okay. there is no, you, you, there will be yes, yeah. there'll definitely be the utility yeah. tie-in and the connectivity yeah. to right. the building. Right. So I, I, no, mean, right? Well, I, you're, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, I'm yeah. talking in an absolute crisis, and mm -hmm. the kids need to be protected in that moment. How are these structures? Design. I'm, I, I'm quite sure they are because they're modular classrooms for students. But I feel I'd like to hear more about sure. it. Mm -hmm. Thank you yeah. very much. That's a great question. I, I did want to um, just close with one other thing. So that when I was speaking with uh, one of the vendors today, he did suggest if we are looking at this option that, in his experience, um, a lot of districts come back within three to five years and add on and add more, and you end up paying more for it five years from now because the costs have gone up and the sites. So, and he did point out that right now the pricing is very good because um, some of the transportation costs are very low due to the gas wow. pricing. Mm -hmm. So there are benefits to, to um, acting on it at this point in time. Nice sales pitch there at the end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so, if in fact if we did go with six, would we be solving the odd and music Plus yes, the, the, the sixth the sixth one, the one for kill up, the actual one for kill up, the goal would be to be able to restore. So, um, if, if we went with six, what I would envision what would happen is the smaller room at Barrows could be recaptured as the music room again. Um, you would be able to take music off the stage at Eaton until 2019-20. And then you could take music off the stage at Killam. So, yes. so currently, those are the places. Those where are the three. Because Wood and Birch Meadow still have their own. Because I'll go back to what Chuck Just said. Yeah. As a town meeting member, I remember it distinctly yes. yeah. when we put in, you know, um, Wood End that this would solve the problem with art in the cart and music in the stage. And <clears throat> so I'm, that's the one concern I have about all this is that we did really make a promise so I'd really like to be able to go back and say you know this is gonna yeah we'll be able we'll happen. be able to do that however and, and I agree completely but I might add <coughs> that when we talked about wood end and I wasn't on the committee that long ago but when we talked about that and we talked about music and art in classrooms that was before the explosion and the realization of full-day kindergarten being so important and that was before a lot of development was done in town so I, I, I hope the community knows that we, we certainly want music and art in classrooms, and it's not our intention to keep coming back and saying, you know, if you give us this, we'll give you art and music. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, okay. I hear you, but I do, I do remember last year, too, that at town meeting, you know, not that I agree with it, but the sentiment from some town meeting members that this was a, uh, a self-created problem by, certainly. by continuing to add sure. full-day kindergarten. Again, I'm a complete advocate for free full-day kindergarten. But and, and the need for it, but I do recall that being a response that we have to be able to address. And um, I agree with that. I agree with that. This is just a, another quick point. Um, <coughs> I'd be thrilled to be able to recapture those art and music classrooms. Thrilled. But another benefit of this is that in the event that there's a population bubble, one year. Yeah, you have we, and again, nobody wants to give up the art and music classrooms, but right now at several of our schools, there's a population, and we found that this year in Eaton, there's yeah. a population bubble, there's no art or music classroom, to, there's nothing to be done. Yeah. Uh, by, by expanding those art and music protections, it's actually an insurance, pop, uh, an insurance policy against population yeah, bubbles, which, which I think is yeah. important. I, I, I might offer, I, I agree, however, I really do want to see what two modular classrooms look like at those sites because they already look tight. I mean, we're already concerned about where they're going to go. So I get it. Absolutely. I, my opinion would be to, to move forward and investigate six. I, absolutely. But I would want to hold final judgment until we actually know what they're going to look like on those sites. Yeah. Sir? Is some of the thought process Could you? I'm sorry. Sorry. Could you state your name? Uh, Pete Terrell. Thank you. Is well. some of the thought process here that there's going to be Dedicated full day classes and dedicated half day classes are they still going to be? Uh, are they still going to be integrated? Yeah, Dr. Dory. I think it's going to depend on the half day numbers. Okay. If you have very low half day numbers, you can't have a half day class of six, some of the six to nine kids. Okay, so some of the concern is that my son's in full day now at Eaton, and there's 24 kids in the class, five of them a half day, and when they leave, 
they're not allowed to teach anything new. They just refresh yeah, right. what was going on in the morning. Yes. Well, I, so yeah, I don't. I, that's my. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I think that's a different conversation yeah. because I don't think that's exactly what's entirely happening. There's other things going on, but it's a, it's a good question moving forward, though, and we can get the answer to what the mix would be between uh, just full just versus an integrated versus half. We can certainly we can certainly get that. I, yeah, I can't I can't guarantee each year how many families want half day, but I also can't have a half-day classroom of 10 kids correct you know so mm -hmm. that's where the integrated plays out and this year we didn't have a choice to eat because we didn't have any more classroom space it's a comment not a question okay. Go ahead. thank you thank you for the question sir <laughs> mrs webb you had your hand up first so. yeah I guess um, I just wanted to comment sort of to John the as we go to um, well finance committee and um, financial forum and then in preparation for town meeting I think we just need to make sure that we're really we have the information and we're cognizant that the town meeting especially is you know going to say well remember what we did the last time we did these building projects and you know sort of here's what we signed up for and I know at the end of town meeting a few nights ago people were after your report right already accosting school committee members about you know, the Barrows project was supposed to do X, Y, and Z. So I think we just need to make sure that we are also, we have the information to show how the current space, you know, here's the current space that's in the classrooms. It's being fully utilized. Um, and I, I think in, in line with the, you know, you, this is a problem that we made. In some ways, I think we have to, I think we have to sort of proudly say, yeah, this is a problem that we made because we have a good school <coughs> district. People want to be here. People want full day K. We want to continue to add programs, whether it's at the middle school level, the high school level, the elementary level, and that takes space. You know, do we want to not do Project Lead the Way here at the high school? We'd have more classrooms. So I think, you know, it's a, that's the, the fact that we're we're growing we're adding things programmatically we have to just make sure we convey that point to town meeting it's not like we've we're um i don't know somehow wasting or not utilizing space that we have well, I, I think it's i think it's it's also the importance of holding kindergarten and i think that's what's lost in this translation mm -hmm. is yes the demand and the need is definitely up right but you know if, if we were able to we would want all our children to have full day kindergarten because educationally, that's what's best for kids. And I think we, you know, we lose that in the translation. Mm -hmm. And I think the families that want full day kindergarten, that's one of their reasons as well. Right, right. Mrs. Tucks. Um, I have a question re related to that. Um, some, some families want half day kindergarten and some want full day kindergarten. Um, and I understand that there are some that actually want full day, uh, sorry, actually want half day kindergarten because of their situations and because maybe there's a stay at home parent or, or relatives or whatever, that's their choice. And I understand how that can be really beneficial. My kids did it. Um, one of my, qu my question is that sometimes in contrast to that, people choose half-day kindergarten because they're on free and reduced lunch or they can't afford a full-day kindergarten program. And my question is whether we've looked at our numbers to see if the majority of those choosing or, or what percentage of those choosing the half-day kindergarten program might be because they don't have another option and whether the state might have or whether there is any help out there for those who can't afford the tuition of a full day. There, there is no the state or federal help for, for students. Um, and do we but we do, we, do have, offer. we do have tuition relief. They have to qualify for it. Um, we don't know next year's kindergarten population yet if they're on pre reduced lunch. But do people are people aware that they can ask about that? Should their oh, decision be yes. because they don't think they can afford yes, it? They, they, yes, they do. They, they are aware. Thank you. It is made clear to them Thank during you. the registration process. Could I, one quick follow-up, Dr. Doherty. It would be interesting to see if we went with a six-modular solution. It would be interesting to see is there room for the 69 half-day students if we were to offer. If there was some sort of a discussion that the school committee had that said we are 
we're not going to offer a half day. We're going to only offer full day, and we'll figure out the tuition for those families that can't afford it. The projection that I did yeah. assumed historical, right? Which means assuming that all students would be in some sort of yeah, it could happen. Yes, okay. because there's so few kids now in half day. Sure. It, it you can you can do it that I way. I don't know if this is the particular if this is the correct night for us to be discussing it, but I guess I'm looking at your point, sir, which is one way to uh, solve the integrated classroom if we consider that an issue or not, and I'm not convinced. But if we offered full day kindergarten for everybody, then that would take care of the integrated. That's the only reason I was asking it, and, and tonight's probably not the right time. Um, that, that would that would have budgetary impact. Yep. Right. Oh, I know. Mrs. Ducks. The, the other um, perspective on that that I was wondering is I was looking at those numbers for half day and saying, like you said, that that's not enough for one whole class at those schools. Barrows, to have a half day class of 12, 12 children, um, that takes half a class for half a day and leaves half a day and a staff person open in the afternoon. So if we're talking about these classrooms, no, it would be a part time. Right now, it's okay. a part time. It would be a part time person. Okay. We, my, we don't. My, we would hire the person as a full time. My question was if half day students, half day kindergarten might be focused in one of the schools that had, um, that it could be focused in one school and the others. I don't. Have you would to have to bus those time. students, which would have an operational impact. And we've heard, and loud, an we've heard loud and clear from schools. So I would, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't I mean, want to go there. I get it though. Ideally, all students should have full day, or you set it up in a way where you're able to provide both with the space and the resources. But you know, the integrated works right now, but it shouldn't be the thing that we should say, okay, this is what we want to do. Mr. Robinson. I had a, a couple comments. Uh, someone said, uh, I think that th this was free. This is still going to be tuition yeah. based. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay, I just want to make oh, sure everyone was no, aware no. of that. <laughs> uh, I guess I'd be a proponent of the the six because I guess I'm trying to look at this realistically. I look at it you know, I know we're saying, you know, we're make we're saying five years isn't is is, but it's probably going to be longer than five years. The mm -hmm. the community's paying for a library right now. There, uh, people are ta talking about an operational override. Uh, there's a lot of uh, I I think when you look at a million dollars cost, that something we know lasts more than five years versus a 20 to 5 to 30 million dollar cost it just makes sense uh, so I don't think we should be trying to convince ourselves that we're going to be building something in less than you know maybe yes. seven to ten years I only projected out five because if you go beyond five the students haven't been born yet <laughs> so that's why I only went out five <laughs> So a couple of things that piggyback on what Elaine said and also uh, something that Dr. Doherty had stated too. Um, I know in discussion with, um, with the people in the community are just hearing from people that um, and some kindergarten parents that are saying that this is a concern they have that there's a perception that you know full day kindergarten is more about daycare than it is the educational value of it. So I think we have to really make a strong statement when this happens that you know the need for full day kindergarten we did address it last year um, and it, it has to be emphasized um, I think again so that people understand that it's it's you know <laughs> ideally you know as I've said full day kindergarten free full day kindergarten is, is really necessary in light of you know common core race to the top initiatives the expectations that we have for our students now have greatly increased I mean I think, and, and plus that, we have, you know, many preschoolers that are going to school full day already. Yeah. Right. So, right. you know, it's almost like a step backwards to go right. half day. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I, I, I don't want to lose the fact also, I mean, you brought up all the academic pieces, but kindergarten is social is a major part of the group, group as well. True. Absolutely. We don't want to lose that. With full day no. experiences, that social piece Absolutely. Totally agree. Totally child. Totally agree. Yeah. 
Yes, thank you for waiting. No, no um, my name is Tricia Guanci Terry, and my son hopefully will be going full day at Barrows. Um, thank you for all your time. I know there's been a lot of prep work, obviously, uh, particularly since the, I think we had a November meeting uh, where you invited us to. But you've done best practices, I'm sure. You're crunching the numbers. But realistically, we've, you have about six weeks to that February 23rd meeting. Um, if the town says, okay, we're going to do this, do you have the time to get the buildings made, you know? Yes, built? that's why we need it. Okay. That's why we need the special town meeting February 23rd. And all that, like, uh, you know, I'm hearing site, site work and bidding and so from now until that meeting you'll continue will you be continuing some of that prep work even though it may not come to fruition to be able to so, so on February 24th if it's a go yes so so just to be clear the the construction of the modulars correct me if I'm wrong yep. the construction of the modulars is on a bid list already okay. we don't need to go out for bid for that because there, there's a state bid list the site prep work we are going to need to go out to bid on that's that's the piece and so in the meantime what can be happening is the modules <coughs> can be getting constructed as the site prep work is going on we need an 18 week turnaround that's pretty good yeah. okay, and, and thank you it's an excellent question we, we did talk about it and again special town meetings are uh, not something to be taken lightly they're expensive and, and we've, we've done the best we can to say if we can have that meeting in February we could meet the deadline for the start of school. And one other thing, Dr. Darty, that you met, you mentioned at the November meeting is you encouraged parents to talk to the town selectmen about the appropriation of money that goes to education. And that it hadn't been changed since 2003? No, that's, that's, not, that's not what I said. <laughs> you want to clarify? You, you, no, you encouraged us to No, what I was talking about the Chapter speak. 70 funding yeah. formula, okay. which is not the selectmen. Okay. That's so the state legislators. So you, you suggested us to go to the state then? The state legislators. State and the state legislators, well, yes. And there are Just hearings more. going on throughout the state right now on okay. the funding formula. But that hasn't my, been changed since 03. Since 1993. Okay. Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you can go you. after Appreciate the selectmen too. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I wouldn't. I just, well, you know, I want to make sure as parents that we're, you know, Absolutely. doing our Thank part you. I appreciate that. In your efforts. I, I just had a quick follow up to Mr. Caruso's comment about just the town meeting and just to make sure that people understand. So the, the superintendent spoke on our behalf at town meeting this past week, uh, letting town meeting members know that we were re requesting this special town meeting on February 23rd. Town, annual town meeting is not until April and so it would, that would preclude this project and we would be sitting here talking about a lottery if we had to wait till April. So it was very important that um, we'd be able to, to get this special town meeting. I just want people to recognize um, your town meeting members have all been doing double, triple duty because we've had um, two special sessions of town meeting already. And there was sort of a lot of size in the room when Dr. Darty, mm -hmm. you know, sort of announced the request. So um, it's very, I think it's very important that you know, many of us are town meeting members. We like to be able to have a vote on the budget that we vote on here. Uh, so to, to get in touch with your town meeting members for your precinct or throughout the town to voice what you, know, you see as the opportunity here and how important this um, special town meeting is. Because if town meeting doesn't run, if it doesn't get a quorum. You can't vote on anything if you don't get a quorum. So we, hopefully people are not just too gosh darn tired out after these marathon sessions that we've had. Um, and the legislators, our local leg legislators, our state legislators, are the people you want to contact on the Chapter 70. Jason yes, Lewis has been sort of leading that effort. Leading that. Yeah. Right, so I, that would be the person. Thank you. Sir, this is Josh. All right, and, um, I'm sorry, I didn't get your last name, but Tricia. Um, your comment begged um, some explanation from a question that was asked at one of our last meetings, which was um, whether people who are not town meeting members can attend town meeting. And at this last, we just had three nights of town meeting this week. And for one of the issues, the gallery was full. Um, of people, and I won't say they were all on one side of the issue or the other, but they did have a chance to be recognized and speak. And the fact that people cared enough really registered with those that were elected to be there. And so I would encourage people to 
like Ms. Webb said, um, encourage their town meeting members to attend because some people are not going to be some um, here at the time because they might go to the to summer sorry go to winter and warmer places mm -hmm. so they might not be there which makes it very important that those that are here actually go and that people who are invested in the issues can attend and can ask to be recognized and that that really does make a difference because it's um, there are a few of us in town meeting and then there might be a lot more that have um, an investment to say so thank, thank you. you and thank you to everyone that has come <coughs> to get up to speed and to lend your minds to these challenges mr. Robinson I'd like to make a motion glad uh, to hear it. I'd like to move to direct the superintendent to pursue a solution to purchase uh, six modular classrooms at an approximate cost of $966,000. Mm -hmm. No, I think we Perfect. Uh, Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? And seeing no, no discussion, got really quiet. <laughs> All those in favor of the motion? Those opposed? And the motion carries 6-0. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to, if it's okay, we're going to take two minutes, and then we'll get started with the budget. Maybe one minute. One minute. Thank you very much.
from my from my piece. <laughs> um, and then the administration cost center will be uh, brief. No, no, I, I've got a number. Wait, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> We're not paying attention. I know, that's why I said it. I feel like the 45. <laughs>school committee uh, meeting back to session so uh, tonight is the first night I had mentioned earlier tonight is the first night of the uh, FY 16 budget discussions uh, I thank members of the FinCom and I thank all of the budget parents and our school administrators and Mrs. Copeland thank you very much for being here I thank everyone for taking time out of their busy schedules for being here uh, tonight Dr. Doherty will present an overview of of the budget um, and then we'll also dive into the administration cost center this evening as well sure. I, I'd like to ask the committee if at all possible, if we could hold questions to the end, that, yep. that might make this a smoother process, but please grab my attention if there's something that you want to ask. Same for the audience. You guys are here, so please feel free to participate. Take it away. So um, before I begin, um, I just uh, want to say that uh, the, the budget process that we began in September, October with the financial forums and, and all of the feedback and input that we received through the process has now led to the product that you have in front of you, which is the superintendent's recommended budget. And a tremendous amount of discussion um, and thought went into the development of, of this budget. Our, our administrators and directors put in a significant amount of time, and I want to thank them because we had some very thoughtful discussions in a very difficult uh, budget, budget year, which will be a very difficult budget year. Um, I also want to thank Martha. This was her very first budget um, as Director of Finance and Operation. You can see um, the, the budget book in front of you is an exemplary product and really tells a great story about our district, but also um, the numbers, you know, give you a perspective of what, what's going on right now and what will be going on next year. Um, so I want to thank Martha for, for all of her hard work um, on this. So. Um, this is, a, this is a calendar of, of how the process is going to work. This is our first night of the discussions. Um, throughout this process, through the month of January, the committee will have, uh, and the community, will have a lot of opportunities to ask questions. And we encourage you to ask those questions. Send them to us ahead of time. And we will do our best to get them to you uh, answered for the next meeting. Once we get those questions and answers, when, they, when it becomes the school committee budget, all of those questions get documented and put in the school committee budget at the end of the booklet um, so that the finance committee and the community um, and town meeting members can take a look at those answers as well. Um, Monday night we'll be doing regular day and special education. As you know, those are our two largest cost centers. And then on Thursday, um, we will do the rest of the cost centers, which include athletics, extracurricular activities, uh, health <coughs> services, district-wide technology, town and school facilities. Um, that will finish the formal presentations. And then Wednesday the 21st, we will have a financial forum um, to have some discussions with Board of Selectmen, Finance Committee, School Committee about, about the budgetary process. By the way, just so you know, the Board of Selectmen are doing the same thing that we are um, during the next two weeks. Um, they are having their budgetary discussions very parallel to, to uh, the School Committee. On the 22nd, we have, uh, by law, you have to have a public hearing. Um, although the community asks questions at all of our meetings with the budget, there is a, a, an official public he hearing on the 22nd. That, and the bulk of that night will be spent answering a lot of the questions that you have regarding the budget. And then right now, you are scheduled to take a vote on the 26th. By statute, I believe now, the budget now has to be given to the town manager by February 1st. Um, and then on March 18th, uh, we will go and present our budget to the Finance Committee. That is the date for the School Committee to present the Finance Committee. So that, that's the, the calendar of events as we, as we move forward. So what I want to do is I want to uh, set the context for the next several meetings. Um, and the budget is developed with some things in mind. 
uh, each year. And so what I'm going to go over in the next several slides are the data and the, um, the information that we use as we are developing the budget. Um, so first we obviously have to start with our vision of where we want to be as a school district, where we want to go as a school district. And certainly, um, we don't have the resources to do everything we want to do, but we want to make sure that we are moving forward and moving in, in the right direction. Um, and with that, as you know, we have a strategic structure to, to, um, to our goals and to our initiatives, and it starts with these four objectives, which are really the core of what we do, the learning and teaching piece, the performance management piece, investing and developing, and then finally, the resource allocation um, and when we developed this budget this year, I will tell you that these four came in, into play. Particularly the resource allocation, you are going to see in this budget there is some several restructuring um, uh, of budget items from the past to get us further than uh, we, you know, where we would like to go. Here are the five district goals that we discussed earlier um, in the in the school year. Um, these are the five that help drive the also where we want to be as a school district and help develop this budget. Um, and then underneath the five goals, which are at the top, these are, you, these are all really the initiatives that we're doing, which was in the, the goal uh, action plan that, that you approved um, earlier in the year. So these are really all of the areas that we're focusing on um, as we move forward on those five goals. So another piece of data that we look, like is, uh, look at is enrollment. And uh, one of the things that is projected to happen that we're starting to see um, is that as you jump from 1415 to 1516, we are expected to see a jump in enrollment, uh, particularly at the elementary school and at the high school as, as our large eighth grade goes to ninth grade. Um, and we've now seen this influx of, of kindergarten students. Um, we are going to see a jump next year in enrollment. And I think that what the discussions we even had today are are talking about that. Um, another piece of data that we want to take a look at is we want to see you know our special education enrollment and I want to I want to point out to you a couple of things. Um, one is uh, this this piece of data right here you notice that last year we had a much lower number of students out of district and that it took a little bit of a jump this year 14, 15 to 61. 61. If you remember, what in, if you uh, through the budget, one of the things that we know of next year is that we have a decrease in our circuit breaker, and the decrease in the circuit breaker can occur when we don't have um, students that reach a certain threshold. And I believe the threshold is around forty-one thousand dollars. So what you see here, and most of those students are out of district. Your your students that cost forty-one thousand dollars to educate are usually students out of district because of the tuition, the transportation. So that certainly is a reflection right here of that decrease in circuit breaker. Now, the, the news for next year when we're calculating circuit breaker is that that will probably go back up because the, the number is back up to 61. So we will probably see an increase back up in the circuit breaker from, um, from current numbers that we're using for the FY16 budget. Um, the other data that we want to take a look at is uh, our high need subgroup enrollments. And one of the things that we that really jumped out in this data is our low income population has increased from 2013-14 to 2014-15. You can see that it's gone from 6.6% to 9.2%. Um, I think there's a couple reasons for this. I, I, you notice we have had a steady increase over the years in the number of students that, that are uh, uh, high needs for low income. But one of the things that has also changed is the reporting tool that's used. A lot of times um, it, there was, it was a paper process in the past and now they use um, what's called a virtual, virtual gateway, virtual gateway um, which makes it much easier to identify students that are low income or on free and reduced lunch. So I think that is also, it, the students may have been there, it's just that they weren't accounted for. So I think this is a much more accurate number now because of the, the tool, the mechanism that they're now using to identify those students. But it has been on the increase for the last um, several years. Class size is certainly something that we also want to look at as we're developing our budget. Um, and as you already know, the one area at the elementary school that we've been concerned about is this Joshua Eaton number. Um, 
which is why in the budget there is uh, a request for a grade one teacher for next year. The rest of your class sizes, for the most part, the K to two class sizes are in that 18 to 22 range. The three to five is in the mid 20 range. Um, our middle schools are, are, have always been in this, in this range here. Parker is, has been always a little bit lower than Coolidge. Um, you can see that eighth grade, both are, are, are pretty large and that's that large enrollment that's gonna go up to the, to the high school next year. And our high school numbers um, are in the, the 18 to, to 22 range as well. As you know, high school um, class size is difficult to calculate because you have different levels in high school uh, in each grade. But those are, those are fairly accurate, uh, accurate numbers. Um, now moving forward it, it, to talk a little bit about how the budget process began and how, what we look at in the financial form, one of the things that's done each year is to take a look at the, the revenue sources and then also take a look at um, the accommodated costs. And then once you know the revenue, once you know the accommodated costs, what is left is really split between town and schools to develop their, their, um, their non-accommodated cost budgets. And so our revenue sources, as you know, um, our, the bulk of it is property taxes. You, have, you do have other local revenues, which include excise tax and um, fees and things like that. Um, you also have state aid. Um, one of the things I think it's important to note is with the Chapter 70 piece is because we have pretty much reached our limit with Chapter 70 funding, the only additional Chapter 70 funding we're going to get from this point forward is any, um, like we have the last couple of years, is the, uh, the, the one where you're held harmless. And so for the last couple of years, we've received an extra $25 a student, and that's been it. We've not really received any additional Chapter 70 funding formula. I think you know what we talked about before, that the funding formula is, is inadequate. Um, there are a lot of things that in 1993 um, were in a formula that they don't, don't hold true today, or were not in the formula that don't hold true today. And there is a, there is a commission that's looking at it, um, but I've also said this before, two things need to happen. The formula needs to change, plus there needs to be an increase in revenue with the Chapter 70 funding formula. My fear is if they just change the formula, we are actually going to see a decrease in state aid. Um, so that's something to keep in mind that it's only one piece of the puzzle. You need both. Um, I think another important piece to remember is that we have become over the last few years more and more reliant as a town um, on our budget to, have, uh, to use an influx of free cash. Um, the fortunate piece is that we've had regeneration of free cash over the last few years, um, so it hasn't really resulted in a deficit um, in, in free cash revenues. Um, but I think we all know that this is not good budgetary practice and that we have a structural deficit that's going to have to get addressed at some, some point um, with, uh, with the budget. So this is, you know, this is the total revenue that we were looking at, at with town and schools as we were developing our budget. We also took a look at our accommodated costs. These are all the accommodated costs that are used. Um, benefits, which are shared by uh, both town and school employees, capital, certainly debt, the energy. Um, we are anticipating there will be a, an increase in energy costs next year. Natural gas contract is ending in June, um, so we are expecting that there will be an increase there as natural gas prices tend to be on the upswing now, although oil prices are down. So that may have an effect in a good way on natural gas. Um, special education is also an accommodated cost, and that's the outer district piece of special education, tuition, and transportation. Um, so then from there, the, um, we knew our number. And so at the financial forum, you know that the, 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 the FinCom recommendation and, uh, is that we would develop a 2.5% budget. 2.5% increased budget, which, which is $41,350,043. Now, we did some calcula calculation of the level service budget and what, what really the, the, the revenue that we would need um, to have a level service budget, and that would be $42,199,663, which really is a difference of 849000 
620, which is a 4.7% increase. So the budget that I'm going to present to you tonight is the 2.5% budget, but we also list how we reduced the budget by 849,620, which is the 4.7% budget. But the budget you have in front of you is the 2.5% budget. In one of the other things that you see in your budget book we talk about is the per pupil comparison. We do not have FY14 or 15 data be, uh, because that's based on the end of the year report and there are some districts that have not submitted that information yet. Uh, but you can see that from a per pupil standpoint, um, Reading is the, the lowest with the comparable communities that we use uh, when, we, when we look at the data. Um, and again, I, as I've mentioned before, uh, and I, I want to I preface this by saying that we are extremely appreciative of the funds that we receive from our community. And that the per pupil comparison is to show that there are two things going on here. One is the Chapter 70 funding piece that I mentioned earlier. And two is the piece I just mentioned about the structural deficit piece um, with the use of, of free cash. But I think the other piece to remember, which is a positive, is that we are also um, cited in a lot of ways for the, the way we manage our funds. And, and when you look at the data, the data shows that we do a very good job with the money that we have. Um, so I think a, a couple of other things to, to take a look at when we're looking at the, the spending categories and, and the state averages. There are some areas that um, we do very well in. And this is uh, FY13. Yes. Um, professional development, for example, we, we are usually above the state average. There are some reasons for that. Uh, one is uh, the tuition reimbursement piece that is part of the collective bargaining agreement. Another is we do, we have five uh, non-school days, uh, non-student days, which are calculated as part of the professional development um, in, the, in the end of the year report. Uh, and, and we also do spend some funding on professional development. We believe that investing in our, in our staff is, is one of the ways that you can build capacity. Uh, you also notice that we're above the state average with instructional materials, equipment, and technology. And the, the big reason for that in this year is this is the year that we purchased the, um, the math program, the new math program. So it was a bump up um, of an influx of one-time funding to purchase that, uh, that new program. So you, you see that that moved us above the state average. The other areas, oh, and then the payments to out-of-district schools. And the reason why that number is so high because sometimes people look at that and say, oh, um, why is that number so high? It's because we have so few students that are in, uh, are in payments to out of district schools compared to other communities, which inflates that number. That doesn't, that doesn't necessarily uh, have a major impact on the total difference between the state and the district. But you can see that um, we're about $2,700 below the state average when it comes to per pupil expenditure. And again, when you take a look at when you're with comparable communities, it, um, the ranking, again, depending on um, where we are, uh, the total is we're 13th out of the 13 communities. Supplies were pretty high. Professional development were high. Um, but the other two areas, which is the administration and classroom and teacher specialists, we, uh, we are more at the uh, lower end. Special education, I want to I want to point out, and one of the things that consciously, and you know, that we've tried to do over the last several years is invest into our in our in-house programming. We feel that for most students, this is the best option for them uh, to be with their peers um, in an inclusionary setting as much as possible. Um, so you could see that over time, we have spent um, invested more in our in-district instruction and programming with special education which has resulted in a decrease in out-of-district tuition costs, which is really the direction that you want it to, to go. Um, also see that over time, the amount of funding that we have spent on special education has gone down with our comparable communities. And again, it's because we are investing more in the in-district programs, which is less costly than sending students out of district. 
And this is the point I was mentioning earlier, uh, historically, the amount of funding that we get in our budget um, versus what we actually spend. And as you know, in uh, last year in FY14, we did turn back a half a million dollars, um, which was mostly special education tuition funding um, for students that um, we had anticipated were going to be um, going to out-of-district placements and did not. <clears throat> So now to the budget. Now that we have all of that data as we, as we look and we calculate the budget and develop the budget. So the big drivers of our budget for this year, uh, for FY16, is certainly any salary and benefit obligations. Uh, next year we'll be in year two of collecting a collective bargaining agreement with all of our uh, five unions. Um, also non-salary, non-unit and sa non-union and salary benefits. And those are in line with the cost of living adjustment for the collective bargaining units. Remember, non-union personnel do not have steps, they do not have columns, um, whereas uh, the bargaining units do. <coughs> so non-union, it's just the COLA, it's not the COLA plus the steps plus um, columns. Um, so that is, that is the difference. We also, in the budget drivers, um, put into account uh, in any anticipated increases in special education, uh, transportation, tuition increases, which is usually about 3% uh, for out of district. Um, we also know that we were getting a decrease in circuit breaker. Um, and also any known students that we think will be going on out of district. What is not in this budget are any unanticipated um, tuition costs paraeducator costs, special, edu special education teacher costs. Um, also, as I mentioned earlier, we are anticipating an increase in natural gas costs when our contract ends June 2015. So those were the major drivers of this budget. So we're going to go through um, the different categories of the budget uh, to give you an idea of uh, how we came up with that uh, $41 million. Um, so the first category is salary and other compensation. Certainly this is the largest category because 80% of our budget is personnel or close to 80% is personnel. Uh, so you could see that this is the largest, this is an increase. Um, and it is again due to all of the, the it's salary increases and step increases, column increases. Uh, so any, any contractual increases in both for union and, and uh, non-union. We have also put into this budget six FTEs which are restructured. And I want to emphasize that these are not additional positions in the budget. Um, these are positions that we feel we absolutely needed to continue to move forward as a district. Um, and we have taken existing funding from uh, line items and restructured them. These are things that we would be doing regardless um, if we were making budget cuts or not. Um, so you can see, we talked about the grade one teacher at Joshua Eaton, the K-8 literacy coach and the K-8 mathematics coach, which were restructured from um, professional development funding. Uh, the board certified behavior analyst, which is essentially taking consulting money that we use to, to uh, uh, bring in a BCBA uh, from the scene collaborative and make it an in-house position. Uh, technician, which we uh, converted some grant savings from the school transformation grant because we're uh, taking a, a piece of, of an existing person to become a data analyst, so a piece of their salary. Um, and a program director for SSP, TSP, we're taking an existing position and converting it to, to a program director. There are some reductions in this category. Um, substitute teachers, um, and I'll go in a little bit deeper with that later, and uh, personnel reduction of regular education paraeducators at the elementary level. Contracted services, um, this is a decrease in this category. Um, some of the decreases include the special education legal services, also the, the uh, restructuring for the BCBA, which I mentioned earlier, is coming out of this category. The non-mandatory busing, uh, which I will go into in more detail uh, in a minute, and uh, the grant writing services. Those are all contract services. Material supplies and equipment is another category that decreased in this budget. Um, the biggest decrease is uh, the building per pupil budgets. Um, 
It's about a $76,000 decrease. Um, essentially, the building per pupil budget is, is the funding that our building principals use for the day-to-day -day operations of the school, uh, materials, supplies, rental for uh, the copiers or leasing of the copiers, um, anything that, that, that is the day-to-day -day operation. Other expenses, um, also saw a decrease. Um, the two decreased areas here is the professional development funding. Uh, and that was restructured for the coaches. And also we added replacement technology hardware, which is restructured from the per pupil uh, spending. It was part of the restructuring. Uh, the special education, tuition, and transportation categories I mentioned earlier was an increase. And this is really a couple things. One is the 3% increase in tuition costs, um, the reduction to circuit breaker, and the increase in special education transportation. And then finally, energy and utilities, which is, shows a decrease of 17,000. Um, a couple of things here. One is that there is um, a decrease in consumption of electricity, which, which means that we've decreased the use of that in the uh, funding in that budget. Um, we are seeing an increase, as I said, we're anticipating an increase in the new natural gas contract. Um, there is also an offset, and a, a new offset to this budget um, for utilities from our extended day program, which leads to this decrease as well. And then finally, the grant and revenue offsets, and this is the piece that made up the biggest um, chunk of the, the, the reduction that we, we made. Um, and there's a few things that we are, we are proposing this budget that there be an increase in offsets to the athletics and extracurricular, um, which would result in an increase in the athletic and extracurricular user fees at the high school. Um, we also are uh, proposing an increase in the revenue offsets for two revolving accounts, one being, I'm sorry, two special education revolving accounts, one being um, the tuition revolving account where we do have some students in district, we have five students currently in district um, that other communities pay to send the students here for our programs. Um, and so we're taking some of that funding to offset the uh, circuit breaker decrease and also uh, it, an increase in, in rise. Um, that we are we are taking an offset from an additional offset from rise um, we are also increasing our offset from full-day kindergarten because of the the increase in full-day kindergarten the number of students and also extended day which is what I had mentioned earlier for utilities and um, also the MECO grant so a few years ago we were uh, taking a hundred thousand dollar offset from the MECO grant we did reduce that down over the last couple of years, we do feel now that we can bump that back up by another twenty-five thousand to bring it back up to a hundred thousand where where it was a few years ago. So here's a summary of the reductions. Um, I'm going to go in a little bit of detail now with this. The grant writing, the grant writing piece. Um, this there is an amount in the administrative uh, cost center for eighty-five hundred dollars. This amount of funding was always put aside in case we were going for some major grants, uh, whether it be a federal grant or a foundation grant, something like that. Um, at this point where we were successful, uh, thanks to um, Erica McMaris, Sarah Bird, last year, who by the way wrote those their own grants, we didn't ask a grant writer to write them. Um, because right now we are, we are managing two major grants um, in the district, we don't feel at this point that we have the capacity to continue with another major grant right now. So we feel comfortable with this reduction at this point. However, it's not going to stop us from writing grants for smaller amounts. We do that all the time. This, this is really precludes us if we want to go for a major grant. But again, as we showed last year, we have gone for major grants without the use of a grant writer. The regular day bus transportation, what we're proposing is that we are eliminating all non-mandatory bus transportation um, for next year unless it can be self-funded. Currently, we do subsidize a lot of non-mandatory bus transportation in the district. Um, and 
students do pay a user fee um, to ride on the bus if they are not uh, re uh, that we're not if we're not required by law to to bus. Um, the, the law says that you have to bus students that are K to six and over two miles from a, from a school. Um, and we do have several students that are on the bus right now that do not do that, and they do pay a fee of three hundred sixty-five dollars. Um, if a bus will be self self-sustained, um, what we're calculating is that the user fee would have to go up to four hundred fifty dollars, and that there would not be a cap um, for those buses. Substitute teachers. Um, there are several categories in the budget for substitute teachers. Some of it certainly is for when a teacher is out for illness. Uh, we also use substitute teachers for professional development or for when uh, for meetings or for special events when we need to use teachers for assemblies, things like that. Um, this reduction is going to take a look at how we use teachers for professional development purposes and for other purposes that are not illness related. Um, so we've already started having discussions <coughs> with the principals on how we can do things more effectively um, so that we can uh, make this, make this um, reduction in the budget. The per pupil budget, um, there's, there's two reductions in the per pupil budget. One is $26,000 of this reduction. The other one you're going to see in the next slide of $50,000, which is restructuring. Um, the per pupil budget, as I mentioned earlier, this is the amount of money that the, um, that the principals receive for the day-to-day -day operations. The middle school and the high school are going to uh, take a slightly larger reduction than the elementary <coughs> schools um, in, uh, on this uh, reduction item. Virtual high school is an online program that uh, students at both the middle and the high school do access. They take courses online. Um, the current structure that we have with virtual high school is that we, um, through the contract way with virtual high school, we hire um, some teachers, we provide a stipend for some teachers to teach online courses. And by them doing that, it gives us a number of slots um, for students to access courses. Um, what we're finding is that that model is not efficient from the fact that we don't always fill all our slots. So we are going to go to a uh, single course subscription offering. We do have money still budgeted with virtual high school for students who want to take a course um, and are able to. What you see here, the 18,120, this is all stipends. So we will no longer have our teachers uh, teaching online courses uh, through virtual high school. Um, I already talked about the uh, Oh, no, I'm sorry. The next one is EMARC restructuring. So uh, we, spend, we spend each year about a little over $200,000 for EMARC services. EMARC is, uh, provides services for our 18 to 22-year-olds, uh, life skills, job coaching skills. These are the students that are on individualized education plans. Um, what, we are, what we are proposing is a restructuring of the, the way we use our EMARC services. This is not going to result in a decrease in the quality of the services that our students are receiving. It's using the resources more effectively. Um, and we feel that we can do this, um, uh, with, this with this reduction. Talked already about the offsets, um, the extracurricular user fee. What we are proposing currently in athletics, the user fee is $215 uh, per sport. Um, we, are, we are proposing an increase to $250 uh, per sport with a cap of, this is where I'm going to, a cap of going from $850 to $950 and an individual cap of $650. Um, for extracurricular user fee, we are proposing increase in the drama um, from $150 to $175. One hundred one twenty-five. Sorry, one hundred to one twenty-five, and um, for someone that's on the tech crew, to for fifty to seventy-five. And I already talked about this item about the increase in special education tuition and rise, and then in the reduction of regular education paraeducators, um, we're not. Um, we are in the process of developing what this is going to look like. It's 
It's going to be a combination of hours um, and FTEs. Um, certainly this will have an impact, a significant impact, on some of the things that we do at the elementary level um, with, with students. So those are the reductions to get to the $849,000 that I showed you with the level service budget. The other piece that we've done is we've done the restructuring piece, um, which I feel um, is extremely important for us to continue to move forward um, as, as a district. And when we go over each of the cost centers, we will be talking in specificity about um, each of these positions, particularly the coaches, the program director, and the BCBA, um, because those, those are new. Um, the grade one teacher I've already mentioned, the two coaches, are certainly extremely necessary to provide that coaching and support for teachers as we are making that transition to the frameworks. Um, we've had a lot of conversation over the last several months about the value of having uh, these coaches to provide that professional development. It only made sense to restructure this from professional development funding. Um, the technician allows us to continue um, to support all of the devices in, that we're using, um, both mobile devices, hardware, laptops, smart boards. Um, currently, we um, have, I believe, 3.5? 3.5. Um, and this would get us an additional FTE to do that. The technology replenishment is to get back up to the level that we were pre this year. Um, we had $100,000 in the budget for technology replenishment. Um, we're trying to get on a five-year cycle. And um, this doesn't get us to a five-year cycle, but it gets, gets us closer to that. So this is a $50,000 restructuring from the per-pupil budget. Program director for student support and therapeutic support um, is a necessary position um, to create a vertical coordination of our student support program at um, Killam, Coolidge, the high school, and our therapeutic support program at the high school. Um, this is to provide support, guidance, coaching for our teachers at each level of these programs. These are some of our most f emotionally fragile students, um, and this position is necessary so that we can continue to have these, these programs uh, remain strong for those kids. And then the board certified behavior analyst is a position um, that we currently contract out for would seem. It allows us uh, to bring an in-house position for approximately the same amount of funding and to provide that in-house support with the same person um, instead of uh, bringing someone in who may be different each time. So taking a look at how does this break down by cost center um, through the, the five cost centers that you're going to now be hearing about over the next several nights, the administration cost center has gone down um, from uh, last year. Essentially, that's because of turnover savings. Um, regular day is up 3%, and that's uh, primarily because of the, um, the salary increases um, through the collective bargaining agreement and, and uh, non-union. Um, special education is up 2.3%, again, because of salary and tuition increases. Um, also, don't forget, in there is the circuit breaker um, decrease um, as well. School facilities is down a tenth of a percent, um, and that is, that is partly because of that additional offset from extended day. And district-wide programs is 4.8%, and a lot of that is salary increases. Um, and that's how you get the 2.56% to get to the $41 million. How does it break down by cost center? You can see that our largest is regular day, which is what it should be because that's, that's where all your instructional core is. Your special education, the second highest one. Um, and then your, your district-wide services is your, one of your smallest ones. Administration is the smallest cost center and then followed by school facilities. Over time, you can see there's been very little change. Um, in the, the uh, allocations, administration has actually gone down over time. Um, your regular day has is, is gone up and down. Special education, the same. So you can see that pretty much the, they, they fluctuate a bit only by a tenth or so of percent. 
Um, this is now taking a look at this by DESE major function. It's just another way of looking at how the, the money is spent. So um, if you're looking at this as a dollar, every uh, two cents goes to district administration. Uh, 76 cents goes to instructional services, which is most of your uh, instructional staff. Um, other school services, five cents. Operation and maintenance is another eight, nine cents. And then payment to other districts is seven, seven cents. And then looking at this from, by the different categories, you can see your professional salaries, which is primarily teachers and um, any certified staff has gone up 4.7%. Clerical, pretty much the same. Other salaries have, have uh, gone down. Um, your contractors, are, these are where your major decreases are from the amount of funding um, that we had to reduce. The 3.4% is the paraeducator salaries. Um, decrease contracted services, which I talked about earlier, supplies and materials. And um, <coughs> I think this is one of the last slides for this piece. The certainly <coughs> this budget does not have all of the needs that we feel we need. And you know, looking back at last year, the needs, and looking at this year, um, one of the things that we were able to do from last year to this year is to put in some of the things from last year's list into this, into this year's budget by restructuring things. So we were able to get some of our unfunded needs from last year into this year, which I, I think is good because it shows we're still, we're still trying to move forward, um, even with difficult uh, times. So um, you can see here that a lot of the positions that we're talking about here focus on either behavioral health, um, providing support to students, in a tier two manner with, at, through academics um, or providing more direct services with special education staff or time to collaborate or having like another instructional technology specialist at the elementary school to provide that support for teachers to integrate technology more effectively. Um, these are the types of positions that you see here um, that will would continue to build capacity, support students, and help us to continue to grow and move forward. Um, but we did not feel that putting an additional million dollars in the budget at this point would, would be uh, beneficial with the resources that we have available. This would have, this would have given us about a 7% increase in the budget um, overall when you include this and the, four point, the, the 850,000. So here is what this budget is not able to address beyond that list. And, and I, I, I look at this as another category, kind of like to the next level, because one of the things that we're going to need to eventually do as a school district is um, take a long look at some of the things we currently offer and how we want to continue to grow. Um, and right now, the budgets that we have can't do that without additional funding. So for example, we talked about full day kindergarten earlier. Um, we know that the chapter 70 funding will not provide us additional funding if we went to tuition free. So that would be an added expense to an operational budget if we were gonna provide that for all students. Um, one of the other things that I know community has talked about, parents have talked about, we have talked about as educators is restructuring the elementary school schedule, eliminating the early release Wednesdays, which right now, a lot of that is to provide contractual planning time so teachers can, can do the things they need to do in the classroom. In order to do that, though, you need to add programs to your elementary schools to give teachers the contractual planning time during the school day. So wouldn't it be exciting to do things like adding additional programs and courses like engineering and computer science and fine arts, maybe foreign language, whatever those things are. One of the things in the goals, you, if you remember, in March we're going to start creating task force by level to start looking at what are the things we need to do to continue to improve as a district, and this would be one of them. Also, what's not in this budget and is something that will have to be addressed in FY17 is implementing, and I know I've been saying this for five years now, but it's going to happen <laughs> next year, 
because the frameworks are here now, <laughs> is we're going to be implementing a new science curriculum frameworks. That will require time, material, funding. It will have to be done next year, um, and that's something that's not in this budget. And then I know Mr. Barker has had a lot of conversations with his staff about the schedule and the types of programs that the high school could offer down the road. Um, so restructuring the high school schedule and looking at program um, to continue to prepare those students for college and career um, is something that is something we want to address, can't address in this budget, uh, but we want to address down the road. Um, so those are the types of things that we do need to do if we want to continue to be a top school district. And then there's a future concern. And we actually had, we were at a town department head meeting today. Um, and we were talking about budget. Both town and schools were talking about this. And we're talking about FY17 because we are very concerned about FY17. We have done everything we can in FY16 in this school department budget to limit personnel reductions um, while continuing to do what we need to do to move and improve as a district. There are no other restructuring things we can do. Um, there are no other offset increases because, as you know, when you increase an offset, that's the level you start at the following year. So the next thing that will happen is if the continuing conditions remain in FY17, as they do in FY16, we will be making personnel reductions next year. Um, and conservatively, what if you remember at the financial forum, this year was a 2.5% budget, next year was a 1.7% budget. So when you look at all that, I would say conservatively, if we were cutting 850,000 this year, we'd be cutting 900,000 next year. Um, so, and I know one of the things that we talked about today is that probably in March, we would be giving you a back of the envelope FY17, what would it look like? Because I think that's something the Finance Committee's requested. So we are very concerned about FY17 um, and, and what, what could happen. So, it wasn't 45 folks. <laughs> yeah, it was. That was close. Uh, just questions? before, yeah, yeah. Are, there, are there general questions or questions? We, we, want to, we don't want to make too many comments, but any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Well, Beth, do you have a question? I don't, it's not a general question, it's like a specific question. Oh, yeah, yeah that's uh, okay. That's even That's even better. way better. Right. <laughs> okay, so on the, can you just, can you go to the um, free and reduced lunch? Yes. And, um, Try. Low income and... And then tell me what page that is or something? It's on page. Oh, they're not numbered. <laughs> well, when you get it up there, I'll, I'll, I'll remember my question. Here. Yeah. I need subgroup enrollments? Yeah. Yeah, other high need subgroup enrollments. I should have just. There Here we go. go. Okay. So. One thing, maybe I just don't understand the definitions of those, because I thought it was interesting that the reduced lunch is really flat, and okay, the, the low income um, enrollment group, you explained this sort of a spike, because that definitely is sort of, um, you know, the trend line is, is sort of uh, like this, and then it goes, that last year, she explained that, but, and was that, is that the same impact on the free lunch, and why isn't that on the reduced lunch? What's it about that? So when I spoke with the food services director, Kristen Morello, one of the things that she explained is that the, um, the virtual gateway that is connected to all the different uh, source uh, assistance, you know, transitional assistance, all the other programs that are out there, identify the students much better now. So a lot, and those, those are the very high needs. Those are the families that meet the criteria for free and that there's not a lot of fluctuation year over year in the reduced. The, 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 so is that self-reported? Is that how, that, this it's virtual gateway, is that something that parents No, it's tapping in because the states communicate that information to us now, whereas before it had to be self-reported. So that's why we think uh, the numbers are going up. That's why we think the numbers, Because the, the people, families wouldn't fill out the paperwork. And why it's not reduced because that's just not generally the population that, that's get, that gets the t to that, through that gateway? 
Correct. And are the low is the low income students getting the free lunch, or is those two what's yes? So the the, the low your, income is the combined of the yeah, free and reduced. Yeah, oh. most of your low income. So the total most of your low income. Oh, yeah. I didn't uh, try to uh, add those. Oh, that's up. okay. There we go. <laughs> it's uh, a, it's the, yeah, I got it. One hundred twenty nine. Yep, eighty seven forty seven. Okay, so that's the combined thing. Yeah. Okay, I see. And the and it's really the virtual gateway really targets that the low income portion that is free lunch versus the reduced lunch. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Robinson, I just uh, have a follow up on that. So I think something, Martha, you just said that they the the data collection's better mm -hmm. now. So you know maybe the number maybe the number from the prior year is not right. Correct. So the increase might not be the as high as we think it is. Absolutely, and that was something that, right. that, that uh, Krista Morello theorized with me. She said, you know, if you go back to 2007 where it was paper, people had to fill out the paperwork to get the free and reduced and see if they qualified or not, that now that we have the, the tools available to, to identify a lot more easily and direct certify basically through, through this, the state systems that we are seeing the increase. Now maybe they'll come up with more better names and free lunch and reduce. Well, that's the federal name for it. Mr. Nunn. So um, not a question, well, maybe it's a question, but a concern. I know we've talked about um, <coughs> reduction of substitute teacher funding, and I know that it was a priority last year to increase that. And I understand that, from what I heard tonight, that it, it would not impact um, teachers' absences or so forth. It would be... Um, curriculum uh, yeah. initiatives and the plan is is not to <coughs> go without a teacher in the classroom if a teacher is out. But then also um, reduction in regular education uh, para educators. Um, I think what I've heard, anyways, and what I recall from my own experiences, is that oftentimes a para educator might be put into that classroom while a teacher is potentially in a. IEP meeting or maybe doing some curriculum work or some testing and um, so I just don't I'm not, not sure if you know I'm wonder, wondering about the offset there that you know we're cutting both areas but we're trying to um, save funding at the same time I, I don't know if that's almost like two negatives to to uh, to reach a goal that I don't know if it's going to be something that's feasible, you know? I mean, I know you've given it some thought. No, we, we've given it a lot of thought, and, and we've already started <coughs> having conversations about the paraeducator reductions and what that's going to look like. I mean, it's going to be a change in the way we do business. <coughs> and then um, <coughs> I would also state, too, that um, I guess another concern that I have, too, is um, um, I noticed uh, the school transformation grant savings, which um, is going into a technician. I understand the need for for you know technology expert at the uh, various levels with all the technology that now is integrated into our curriculum and our student learning. But we also um, are saving some funding from. I know we reduced the health educator cost at the high school. There was some savings on that. A percentage of that. <clears throat> thought I thought I heard from the. We didn't. We didn't change. We didn't. Say, can make any savings from health um, so we're not you're not using grant funds to pay Sarah um, sorry for the other Sarah wasn't there some funding going being directed towards her salary from the, from the grant from the um, just just the after just the after school fees all right but isn't that isn't that already been accounted for wasn't that it, part it's of her salary it's accounted for in the the whole the whole pot yeah so Essentially, th that was money that we were paying anyways, though. I, w wasn't she getting paid to do that already? And now we're putting some funding into that, so the district is saving some money? The district, that went into part of the cut. Right. When I'm, right. That was what I was looking for to hear. Yeah. So my, my question is, too, is that a year ago we cut health education at the middle school. Right. And, um, you know, I, I don't, I'd like to see that as a priority. We've talked about it. But it hasn't happened. I know you've mentioned in your in your uh, goals for next year that it would potentially happen next year if we had an override. It was two years. Two if you years. Look at my goals. It doesn't say for next year. It says okay. for the following. Year. Even even worse, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, there's a great need for it in the community. Is it? There's a cry for it. Um, we get that. We're seeing behaviors escalate. Um, you know, at, at 
you know, students that have recently graduated, but we're also seeing some behaviors now um, with our current student population that are concerning. We, and, we um, understand that we've had that conversation. We I know we've had conversations, you, but... No, no, I'm talking about with administrators. I'm not talking about... Right. And we've also talked with school committee. Um, and Mr. Crusoe, I don't know if this is the type of conversation well, that we want to have now, or... Do you think it would be more applicable when we're actually talking about that cost center? Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, that's... But I, I guess to answer your question, I think to do health education right, the middle school one position is not the way I would go. agree. But so I, I would. that's why I think we have to wait until we have <coughs> the funding to do it right. All right, but I'd also think that it would be, it would work at the elementary level. We've had that discussion. But anyway, so we can talk about that when we get to regular day, I guess. And, and then just one last comment to that is, um, I'm a little concerned that we talk about that health education position is sort of, wouldn't it be nice to have these to offset the uh, yeah, extended, uh, the, the, the full Wednesday, you know, we need to, we need to essentially up, uh, set up planning time for our classroom teachers, which of course is necessary, but it almost seems like the way it was presented, I don't think you meant it that way, but it came across that way to me that, you know, well, the health education position would help, you know, that would be the, the key component of health education. No, that, no, <coughs> and if I said it that way, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, my, my point was the only way that you're going to be able to go to a full Wednesday well, program right. is if you provide that planning time throughout right. the week. I, I understand To that. do that, you need to add staff. Right, I understand. So that. my point is, is that rather than just saying, okay, let's add more art, music, and PE, let's add other programs that we currently don't have at the elementary and enhance our elementary school day. I, I understand That's that. what I'm saying. But, uh, but I'm also saying it's, it, the way it com comes across, it's not so much that it's needed as much as it's going to help um, that Wednesday afternoon issue. That's how it came across to me anyways. <clears throat> well, unfortunately, that's the reason why we have the Wednesdays right now. So that's why I have to say it that way. We have the Wednesdays right now because we have to provide concern. It's concerning if that's the way we're stating it. No, but that's the reason oh, I, why. I hear what you're saying. <laughs> don't, don't get me wrong. I hear so why you're saying it. I understand that. <laughs> what I'm saying is I think it should be, um, I don't like it seeing presented as that. I think it's important enough that it should stand on its own. It shouldn't necessarily be stated that way. That's just my comment. Mrs. Brosky. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, kudos to the work that you've all done, truly. It's really impressive. Um, I have a question about the circuit breaker. How much of that actually covers our out-of-district placements? And is that number changing over time? I know like every year, Chapter 70 covers less and less, right? Is circuit breaker similar? Chapter 70 doesn't really fund anything specific, and it goes to the town and to the town general fund. Um, but Circuit Breaker, uh, it covers our out-of-district. It's used exclusively to cover tuitions for out-of-district, whether it's uh, in-state private or in-state residential. I know for this current year, we're using our, our $1.1 million award for uh, residential only. Like, we're not splitting it up between day and, and residential, we're just using it for residential primarily. So next year's award, actually let me restate that, this year's award that we have been able and very fortunate to save and have budget certainty in next year is $952,000 and um, how we'll apply that, I would guess we'll apply it mostly to out of state residential. The um, program. Circuit Breaker reimburses about 70 to 75 percent of our costs. Cost. That's the yeah. number. Depending Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I misinterpreted <laughs> no, your question. No, that, that was good information anyway. Okay. <laughs> so 70 to 75 percent. Is that yep. changing over time? Um, it, depends. Actually it depends. Um, it depends. In some years, it has. Okay. Uh, and that's yeah, the years that we had to make nine C cuts, it has. Um, that was four or five years ago. It was down as low as and 50%. And as low as 40. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, I think yeah. it's been 40. It's back up to 75. Yeah. Okay, yes. thank you very much. This is what? Uh, yeah, I have one question. The slide that you, actually I have more than one question. The slide that you had that um, had at the very end here, I just want to know, is it in the budget book? It basically summarizes the information on like pages 11 and 14. The um, things that you had to cut, basically the places that you had to cut. You have one slide that sort of summarizes them all. Right. It was like your yeah. second or third to last slide. And I just, as I'm going through the budget book, I'm just wondering if that's not in here. It's in there. Oh, it's in there. It's in, it's in, in the, the superintendent's message. message. It's right in the front. Page eight. Oh, page eight. Okay. You talking about this? 
Um, no, the very, at the very end, you had more details describing... Unfunded? Yeah. Oh, the unfunded. unfunded. The That's, stuff in you described well. That's in there as well. There's a whole explanation in there. This, oh, you okay. this? That's page 11. Uh, page 11. Oh, okay. That's what I was looking for. It wasn't in the same colors. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, and I, I, can I, Mr. Crusoe? Of course. Um, so on the per pupil spending, I just was sort of curious. The supplies and materials was, is, I totally That's wasn't expecting that. I, I think we said, is that also related to the curriculum implementation? That, that's the math in focus. Okay, because that was... It was a one-time amount. I believe yeah. it was about 350000 I want to say we went from being oh. eighth last yeah. year to second this year. You did to, It's oh, a I significant thought. jump year okay, over so year. Okay, so did it show so up... that's the math It curriculum. shows up maybe in more than one way because when you look at the state information, you're looking at... There's one way they cut it and they look at maybe curriculum mm -hmm. and another way where it's like materials and supplies. Correct. Okay, so I saw it. I was just making sure that I was seeing that. We've tried to show it to you through different lenses, which I know sometimes can be confusing, but I think it's helpful. And I, um, so I think overall I appreciate the way that it was laid out. Um, and although I share Mr. Nines, Concerns about the health. I think um, I'm still sort of processing, sort of all of the things that are, you know, unfunded and, um, you know, what the priorities are. And I, I really have a significant concern about making sure that we can address the sci that science curriculum. I, you said it's been five years, but it's been. No, no, I didn't say. I said I've been saying it five years in this. Oh, position. in your <laughs> position. Okay, because you've been saying it. Oh, for <laughs> okay. Right, since 19, okay, I just want to write, since more I made a, I made a comment the other day, when we, I know. Was, we presented, <laughs> the we budget presented parents. that the science curriculum hasn't changed since I started teaching science at Coolidge, right. which was a long time ago. ago. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I have a sort of flag just to raise that I think that um, I understand why we need to increase the athletic and extracurricular user fees. I would just like us to take note and watch what happens when we do that. If there are people that then start children that start not participating because, yes, they might be able to get uh, qualify for help, but they might not ask for that help. And so my concern would be if people, if families stop saying yes to their students when they want to participate. That's one concern. The other concern is that all of our money sort of comes from one pie, and the parents in all of those organizations are not just paying those user fees. They're also paying for fundraisers, for raffle baskets, for et cetera. And if they end up, we end up not having the money to do, having to make choices between where the money goes, we might see money that we rely on now. You alluded to the fact that our pupil per pupil spending um, and the managing of our money reflects how wonderful our parents are and their contributions to. Uh, maybe I'm extending what you said, but our no, parents cover a lot of the costs that otherwise would mean cuts in in extracurricular activities and and extra enhancing learning opportunities. So I think that we need to keep sight of that. And if we do do this increase this year, we need to keep track of what the ramifications of that are. And if you notice in the budget book, we do keep track of participation rates. I believe it's over. It's towards the back of the book, yeah. It's over 1,200 kids. Mr. Robinson, I, I didn't, I wasn't going to bring that up tonight, but since since it's, it's come up, uh, I'm having a problem with, with it for a couple reasons. Uh, well, one of the, one of the reasons, as, as Ms. Dr. Doxer said, is we're already on the backs of parents through fundraising and uh, raffles and selling cards and uh, to raise money, but one of the things that that I think it also will do, it may not be happening now with athletic fees, but as we increase them, I think I might have mentioned this to you, we're putting pressure on the coaches because there's going to be an expectation from parents that 
you know, why isn't my son or daughter out there on the field? I'm paying, you know, you know, whatever, whatever we went up to. I mean, that, 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 and I, I think that's coming down the road. It's already happened. Sure. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, there's communities that don't charge athletic fees at all. And, uh, you know, I don't know where I am with it yet because we're just starting the budget process. But when I saw that, that was one of the concerns I had. Can I just make a global? We're going to have comment? a much longer conversation on that particular. Like, the yeah, no, not about athletic fees. It's just a global comment. Yeah. I, I mean, um, you know, going back to this reduction list, which I, um, hold on. Or maybe it's the other way around. Anyway, um, I think one of the important things when we put together this budget, one of the, I think, things that we wanted to make sure we avoided as much as possible was. Cutting, cutting teachers in the classroom. Um, when we first started this process, and the principals and other staff can attest, because we were, um, everyone's been a part of it, um, you know, there was a lot of those positions that we were looking at when we first started this process, when we saw that we had to cut, you know, around $850,000. So that was our whole basis. <coughs> Um, certainly, the committee can take that information and they can they can make the changes necessary. But our our goal was to avoid major personnel cuts. And I, I know I know that there's a lot of things here that we don't. I don't agree with a lot of the things on the list. But the bottom line is it did save making reductions in other areas. So. Thank you. Me? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Talk about the administrative process. Sounds like an award speech, didn't it? <laughs> I want to thank you. Um, so this is the the major cost um, cost center function. We obviously we fund the school committee, um, superintendent, the assistant superintendent, business and finance, um, human resources. Um, we fund a portion of the district-wide information management person and um, legal services and, and also that could be there is the audit services um, which we're gearing up for our end of year audit and our, our single audit of our IDEA grant which would be great. Um, so John touched on this a little bit earlier with the major administrative initiatives and um, certainly MTSS and Parker are, are big on the list but um, other things that we want to do is we really do want to look at developing systems to evaluate our resources. Um, we do have a new HR administrator, and this is something that we are working in, in together on, on looking at how we can look at how we're staffed. Um, uh, certainly, we want to strengthen our human resources systems to better support our staff. Um, Michelle Saunders has some wonderful ideas, so hopefully we'll be working on those soon. Um, the Early Childhood Working Group, I know, is working hard on the development and implementing a long-term plan for space needs. And obviously, I did a presentation earlier about space needs. Um, oops, I think you need to. No, I didn't see. I know you didn't do it. So as you can see, they're really, um, there really hasn't been a significant change in headcount year over year for the administrative cost center. We have the administration, which is um, uh, the administrative assistants, district administrators. This is um, the point three is the district wide technology person, um, and then the other four would be uh, John, Craig, myself, and uh, Michelle. Um, this cost center. Really, the, the professional salary line, the 4% the savings, that's, that's staff turnover. 
Um, we have had an increase in legal fees, which is showing up here in our contracted services. So this increase is a function of um, the increased legal sense, which is offset by a grant reduction, the, the grant writer that we talked about earlier. So the increase in legal is somewhat offset by that. Uh, this is the good one. So, um, as you can see, we're, we're fairly consistent with the school committee. We budgeted to have um, additional funds for new members coming on and attending conferences, things like that. Um, the superintendent salary line, uh, that's not the salary line, that's a lot of other things in there too. <laughs> um, <laughs> that would be nice. Um, the the biggest thing here is, is in the, I don't know if you can see it well on the, the chart up here, but all of these ones, the this <coughs> beginning would be the one, that's the DESE code charter accounts and where these things fall into that per pupil that we've talked about before. So anything that starts in a one start will roll into those 11 different categories differently based on what that number is. Um, the other thing to know here is I know we had a, a question about legal services. So I did want to talk about this for a minute. So when you look at legal services, it does look like it's going up in a normal percentage. And that's because it's being compared to the 2015 budget. And when you look at what we've budgeted and what we've spent over the last few years, <coughs> certainly you would, you would think that we've underfunded, underfunded the budget line. And so when we, we're looking at the budget for this year and thinking about making budget corrections on where we really should be budgeting the money appropriately, that's why it's up there at $27,000. Through five months this year, we've spent $9,000 in legal fees. Um, so if you were to extrapolate that over 12 months, it is about $21,000. But the first four months, the first few months of the year or the summer, no one's here. So we don't have as many issues and we're not really tapping into it as much. So I think conservatively, $27,000 is the right amount to have in that line. Um, uh, the, other, the other question that came up that I wanted to speak to was about employee benefits. So this is a contractual obligation that is in the teacher contract. So as part of the teacher contract, if they participate in a 4013B, we will match their deposit, uh, we'll match their contributions $175. The participation, as you can see, over time has somewhat increased. This year, um, we actually exceeded the budget amount. We have budgeted 10,650. We actually spent a little over 12,000 because the participation in 4013Bs has gone up. So the budget number that's in there for next year does assume a slight increase in participation in teachers and 401, or 403s. Um, as as uh, Dr. Doherty mentioned earlier, the biggest drivers of this budget were the, the COLA increases. Uh, a lot of the, actually not a lot, all of the personnel in this budget are not new uh, members. So it was a 3%, we used a 3% for any non-union, non-contracted position uh, throughout the budget, um, which uh, the basis between a 2.5% or a 3%, the difference is about $16,000 if we were to readjust to a 2.5%. Um, obviously, I already spoke about the increase of legal, um, the decrease in grant writing. Um, we did uh, slightly decrease our supplies. Um, and reduce some, you know, do some membership things that, that uh, have changed over time. And I already spoke about the 403B. Um, the biggest drivers here are the, the collective limit. Oh, I found I went too far. You went to book. Yeah, this is the last one. Look at that. Last one. For tonight. <laughs> Great. Questions from the committee? Mr. Robbins, what is the reduction in fees? Um, uh, Ms. Delai was a member of a few organizations that I don't know. <laughs> no, um, ASC is still in there. Yeah, no, ASC is still in there. No. Um, it, uh, she, as an assistant superintendent, they were dues for her to be part of NASS, yeah, she, that I'm not in. And, uh, and also, she was a member of the national chapter of ASDA, which I have enjoyed. So, so a couple things. Further questions for the I guess so. It's well for care. Thank you very much. Oh, no. oh, Dr. Dunn, Sorry. Sorry. I had to find my page. So you mentioned under the major administration initiatives, 
develop a system to measure performance and connect expenditures to performance measures. Do you mind saying a little more about that? I guess my flag is that I see performance measures and I, I worry that that has to do with test results and test results go up and, and improve and, and that suggests that money is well spent or something like that. I just don't want to see a linear relationship. Uh, I, I don't necessarily interpret it that way. Certainly that's one way you could look at it. If, if we were to look at some data, if, if we are able to hire a K-8 math and literacy coach, and we do see improvement in our math scores, you know, we might be able to attribute some of the, the spending on those resources to that allocation resource. So it fits some of that, certainly. But I guess I, I didn't necessarily see it as a one for one or a direct tie to that. Mr. Robbins, uh, what I, I guess I, I just picked up on, I didn't see it in the narrative when I read it, uh, the increase in employee recruiting expenses. Can you explain what that is? I, I think that's the school spring. School spring. School spring is our, uh, the tool that we use when people apply to apply online through school spring, yep. and that's an increase in the. Uh, and that's the, a budget driver? It's an increase. Increase. It's in, don't forget, this is the smallest cost center, so. Anything that goes up a little bit's a <laughs> driver. Uh, 17 bullet per slide. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, do some of that. Is that the funder hiring and training for the school spring? Well, the other thing that also has gone up in that human resources line in, in general is, is we have, um, we do have an increase in our expense for pre Oh, the physicals too. Yeah. Um, the, the town did hire a new town physician. They went with Quadrant, which is a, an oh, agency yeah. up in, in um, uh, yeah. Beverly, and, and our costs have gone up significantly. But when you're hiring 100 people, it goes up 40 bucks. That's worth it a minute. We saw Dr. Green. Yes. Yes, we both did. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Martha, thank you again for being oh, so well prepared. I appreciate it. I'm sorry. So you're sorry. saying that we changed our provider and the cost of the physicals for we, employees we went up. The, well, the town decided. The town changed town, the provider. And I know we use Quadrant at work too, but that it basically went up forty dollars a physical. Yes. yes. <coughs> and was we have it, no it, choice. No, it's a town-driven decision. It just doesn't seem. I don't know. It's a we have it's a town-driven decision. We're actually happy with Quadrant, the, the previous contractor. Well, were we, are we paying for, you know, were we not getting the services that we needed previously, and this is an increased cost, but town we have... Driven. It was a town-driven town driven decision. decision. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got the sense okay, that Okay, sorry. <laughs> 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 you want to sit back Thank down. You. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have the largest number of employees, so it may be town-driven, but we pay the biggest share then. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. So the budget conversation continues oh. Monday evening. Yes, it does. And we'll be doing regular day and special hour. I'll be appearing nightly for... <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Robinson. Uh, we have some donations. Uh, move to accept the donation of the amount of $1,000 from the Coolidge Science Olympia Support Group to be used to support the science team's coaches. Is there a second? Second. Is there a discussion? Right. Seeing none, all those in favor of accepting? Very opposed? Motion carries 6 0. <clears throat> Move to accept the donation in the amount of $2,500 from the Eastern Bank, Bank Charitable Foundation to be used to support the MLK Day celebration activities. Is there a second? Second. And I know we're going to hear more. No, abstain. Yeah. Well, on Monday, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Questions? <coughs> Great. All those in favor of accepting the donation? Opposed? Oh, I was voting yes. Sorry. I know you were. Yes. Motion carries 6 0. Thank you very much. Uh, so, again, our next meeting is Thank Monday you. evening starting at 7 o'clock. Your regular day budget. Thank you, everyone who stayed to Hung the end. Hung in there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> of course, Mr. Procedural. Just, are we going to have a, a, a <laughs> night where we can talk about? Not where we're going over a budget, where we can just have a philosophical. Oh, problem. absolutely. Uh, you, um, if you notice on the calendar, I'm sorry. So yeah, the public it. hearing night 
the public hearing usually is not a lengthy uh, oh, meeting, yeah. that piece. So that's an opportunity, and then the following meeting you do as well. You actually have an extra meeting built in this year. We started uh, on Thursday this year. Last year we didn't start until Monday. Okay. Great. Thank you. Any other questions before we adjourn for the evening? Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? We're adjourned.